<clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Sagoyan. I work for the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. And one of the things I do is I study surveillance. I study how uh, governments spy on people, which in many ways is a study of power. Surveillance is a tool uh, used by those with power against those without power. So for more than 100 years, uh, our telephone companies, our, what are now our, our broadband companies, have facilitated the surveillance of their users for the, the state. Uh, and this is a long relationship that goes very deeply, uh, and it's a close relationship. These companies uh, have been helping the government, as I said, for 100 years, and uh, when you receive requests for 100 years, uh, you end up with a very close and friendly relationship. And as the, as the telecommunications technologies have evolved from uh, telegraph and telegram to cell phones and uh, broadband, the surveillance technologies have evolved too. Uh, essentially what has happened is that the telecom companies have been forced to build surveillance features directly into their networks. <clears throat> and I, I want that to sort of sink in for a second. Our communications networks were designed first and foremost with surveillance in mind. This wasn't something that was sort of bolted on after the fact, but as each key feature was being deployed, each new communications feature, whether it was cell phones, text messages, uh, email, the government ensured that they would be able to spy uh, on, the, on these new uh, communications methods. And in many ways, surveillance for the last, I guess, 80 or 100 years has been possible because so much of our information was sent over unencrypted links. Our data went over wires or over the ether uh, without any protection. And so to be able to monitor our calls, to be able to monitor our texts or our emails, uh, a government merely had to put themselves between one of the users. So this is uh, one, of the, one of the Snowden slides that was released a few years ago. This is actually a GCHQ slide, so um, uh, this is relevant to a UK audience. This is from 2009, uh, and now of course, the web in 2009 looked very different from the web today, and one of the things that has changed, uh, of course, is the use of encryption, but back in 2009, most of the sites that you would have visited would have been unencrypted. That meant social media companies like Facebook and Twitter and MySpace, because people still use MySpace back then, um, email providers like Google uh, and Yahoo and Hotmail, uh, and even news organizations uh, and encyclopedias like Wikimedia, uh, we're all sending data over the internet with, in plain text, which meant that with the help of a friendly internet provider, uh, either a broadband provider or an upstream provider who would, um, who would uh, provide access through international cables, governments could watch everything that we were doing. So that's changed, and it's changed in a big, big way. Starting sort of in 2010, uh, Google was the first major provider to, to move towards uh, HTTPS by default, uh, 2011, 2012, the ball really started rolling. We now have Facebook and Twitter and Microsoft and Wikimedia and news organizations like The Guardian uh, and The Washington Post and The Intercept. We've moved to a web that is increasingly encrypted by default, which means that governments can no longer spy uh, just by monitoring one of the links. This was a tweet that uh, I saw just a week or two ago. This was Mozilla announcing that more than 50% uh, of web pages that were loaded by Firefox users were going over HTTPS. That's a huge, huge milestone. Uh, and efforts like Let's Encrypt are helping to move the web even uh, further in that direction. So, of course, Edward Snowden uh, revealed to the world in 2013 uh, really how, how bad things were. And, and one of the points I really want to emphasize there have been so many Snowden stories, there have been so many surveillance stories, and for those of you who don't read every article, they, they can sort of blur together. Uh, as someone who has read uh, every article that's come out and every slide that has been published, um, for the most part, the intelligence agencies don't have any magic tricks. They've been taking advantage of low-hanging fruit uh, and of the fact that the engineering community and the tech community, we've been really lazy. Right? We knew how to encrypt data, and we weren't. We knew how to encrypt web pages. We knew how to encrypt emails as they were going back and forth between email servers. We knew how to encrypt text messages and telephone calls, but many of us weren't doing it. And for, in, in many ways, this wasn't because of the cost of doing so. 
it was because of inertia. We hadn't gotten around to doing it or because protocols were not designed to be secure by default. And of course, we're all lazy. Uh, so that's been starting to change. And so the, the web is increasingly encrypted by default. Uh, many, many email services now use encryption, uh, not from the user to the user, but from one server to another, which again means that uh, governments or other parties that are trying to monitor communications will no longer be able to do so. Uh, and of course, uh, this has reached uh, the front pages of newspapers. Uh, there was a, a very high profile fight between Apple uh, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation this year, in part because Apple has put so many resources into securing its products and its services. So what has Apple done? They've encrypted data stored uh, on mobile devices and desktop devices by default, which means it, all you have to do is have a password or a PIN number and uh, law enforcement agencies or intelligence agencies will have a very difficult time extracting information uh, from your device. They've also turned on encryption for text messaging via iMessage uh, and uh, video and voice conferencing with FaceTime. Critically, what Apple has done with, uh, with iMessage doesn't require any opt-in on, on behalf of the user. If you have an iPhone and your friend has an iPhone, you automatically get encryption without having to do anything. This is a, a real game changer. So Apple did this in 2010, the iMessage and FaceTime thing. Uh, and then uh, other companies have followed, uh, most uh, sort of uh, famously WhatsApp, which turned on end-to-end -end encryption uh, just a few months back. Uh, and now a billion users uh, benefit from uh, a secure text message service enabled by default that governments cannot readily monitor or hack into. So, for those of us who care about privacy, for those of us who don't want governments to be able to easily monitor uh, individual users, and particularly who don't want governments to be able to engage in bulk surveillance of populations, uh, this is a game changer. Uh, encryption is finally available, and not just to the nerd elite who can deal with uh, tools as difficult to use as PGP, but finally, uh, encryption is being built into widely used uh, consumer services and turned on by default. So for us, this is great, but uh, governments are, of course, not taking this lying down. Uh, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, in, uh, on the continent in Europe, uh, in Asia, government leaders are speaking out about the fact that one consequence of this is that they can no longer monitor the people that they consider to be threats. And of course, uh, some governments consider the greatest threat to be terrorism. Other governments consider the greatest threat to be human rights activists and journalists. Um, but government leaders around the world assert that they have a responsibility uh, and a right to target the communications of people they consider to be a threat. And they are very upset that companies, particularly American technology companies, are essentially thwarting their ability to do their jobs. So this is, uh, this is our FBI director, Jim Comey, uh, who has sort of been the public face of the anti-encryption uh, debate in the United States. Uh, he has said that they don't want a back door in encryption, they actually want a front door. I'm not really sure what the difference is. Um, but, but this is a front page news in, in, in the US and this is front page news around the world. Uh, you know, we, as, I'm, as a, everyone knows, we have an election in, in a couple of weeks in the US and regardless of which way it goes, next year this issue will come back. Uh, there will be a, another round uh, of the encryption fight I suspect it will not involve uh, law enforcement agencies trying to pressure companies who make encryption. I think that ship has sailed and I, I think that most people in the government realize there's no way to claw that back. But governments are not gonna take this lying down. Governments will respond to the threat that they feel encryption poses. Uh, and the major way that I think governments are gonna respond uh, is through the use of hacking software. So, uh, for more than 15 years, the FBI has had the capability to hack into people's devices, into people's phones, into laptops, turning on webcams and microphones remotely. Uh, this is not just a capability that has, uh, that has stayed with the elite federal agencies. This is something that's trickling down uh, in my country, eventually will trickle down to state and local law enforcement agencies, uh, and around the world is now available to basically any government willing to spend a few hundred thousand dollars on hacking software because of the emergence 
of a market, an international market for surveillance technology. A hacking team, an Italian firm, ha has been in the headlines, but they're just one player uh, in a global industry. And so the governments of Vietnam and Ethiopia uh, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, Abu Dhabi, they all have these tools. Uh, and of course, um, while there are criminals uh, in these countries, uh, for some reason, governments seem to keep getting caught using these tools against journalists uh, and dissidents and political opponents. <clears throat> Why does this affect the Mozilla community? Well, uh, if governments cannot trick people into downloading spyware, uh, in many cases, they will need to leverage previously unknown vulnerabilities. And so there's a big conversation that's taking place, at least in my country, about whether or not uh, law enforcement agencies should be uh, acquiring and then stockpiling so-called zero-day vulnerabilities uh, in widely used software like Firefox. So this is a, a global conversation that's taking place around surveillance, and I think it's important to understand that there are cybersecurity issues. I think it's important to understand that there are privacy issues. But there are also some very basic human rights issues that have not been part of this debate, and I think really need to be part of this debate. And really what I mean by this is that we are not all equally vulnerable to surveillance. Let me explain what I mean by that. So as I said before, Apple has put a lot of time and money into securing its platform. Apple has turned on disk encryption by default uh, so that if a device is seized, data cannot be extracted from it. The company has turned on encryption for text messaging, voice, and video chats by default so that governments increasingly cannot wiretap uh, users with iPhones. Uh, Apple also has put a lot of time and resources and commitment into ensuring that users receive regular security updates. So if you buy an iPhone, you can expect to get regular updates for four or five years uh, as soon as flaws are found and then the company is, is notified. So what that means is that governments who wish to hack Apple users uh, because they cannot wiretap them uh, are going to have to use zero-day vulnerabilities. They cannot rely on the fact that Apple users will be using out-of-date, insecure software um, and cannot use flaws uh, for which patches exist, but users haven't rolled out those patches. So what that means is people who have iPhones are increasingly off-limits to law enforcement. Now, part of me thinks that's great. It's great that, that this company has made it easy for users uh, to, keep, to keep protected from the state. But the other part of me is concerned that not everyone can afford a $600 device. Digital security should not be a luxury, but it is a luxury. And so because of the security of, the, of Apple's platform, because of the security that Apple has built in, it means that those in our society who have the greatest resources, those in our society who have access to lawyers, who are less likely to be targeted by the state in the first place, are increasingly off limits to law enforcement while those who do not are more exposed. So there are sort of two smartphone operating systems that dominate the market, iOS and Android. Android is a security shit show. So uh, Android users rarely get security updates. Um, only 20% of Android phones on the market right now are using uh, Android 6.0, the most recent release. Uh, many Android users are using versions of the operating system that are years behind which means that law enforcement agencies don't even need to leverage a zero-day vulnerability. You are, if you have an Android phone in your pocket and you do not have a Nexus phone or the new Pixel phone, more than likely you are using a device that is insecure and that can be hacked without a zero-day vulnerability. Uh, in addition to the, the security update issue, many Android phones still do not use disk encryption by default, which means if your phone is seized by the authorities, they can extract data off the device. And uh, Android's default text messaging app does not use end-to-end -end encryption or even offer it. So if you compare an iOS user to an Android user, the iOS user gets security updates, they get default end-to-end -end encryption, and they get um, disk encryption too. Uh, Android users get none of these things, which means that Android users are hopelessly vulnerable to the state. Now again, if Android phones cost 600 bucks, and iOS devices cost 600 bucks, I wouldn't care, I would say let the market decide. But Android is dominating the low end of the market, which means those in our society who are the most vulnerable, 
those in our society who are more likely to be harassed by the state, who are more likely to be wiretapped, who are more likely to have their devices seized, are using devices that leave them hopelessly vulnerable to surveillance. And so the difference in the security features in iOS versus Android, uh, it's creating what I call uh, a digital security divide. It means that those in our society who are the most vulnerable, who need encryption the most, are the least like to, likely to get it, while those who uh, have all the resources, who are the least likely to be surveilled, have devices that put them completely off limits from the state. So this is a problem. I don't have a solution, uh, but I think we need to start talking about the fact that encryption uh, and digital security has become a luxury, uh, and that this threatens to perpetuate existing uh, inequalities in our society. Thank you very much. Time for one or two questions. Anybody got a burning question for Chris? There's one over there. One, one down here, yeah, okay. Yeah, one over there. Just to, whoever gets to the microphone first, okay. And then the other one is down here. So being a software engineer, I feel um, I'm probably tempted to be on the side of as much as encryption as possible and all those things. Um, but I, I do wonder, uh, when we talk about the encryption uh, uh, obviously serving the good of the privacy of the people versus um, actually stopping, you know, not just terrorists, because I don't think it's very effective there, but it's probably more effective in, in areas like child pornography and things like that. I have friends in law enforcement. They do actively use these, these types of exploits to, to combat those things much more than actual terrorism. Um, isn't it a concern that in the countries where people are most vulnerable, uh, places like Qatar, places like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, or, or you know, anything like that, governments could intervene at a different level and simply make sure people have insecure phones, um, even, uh, even if, if in, in Western countries like us, where the governments are somewhat less likely, at least, to use those methods against uh, political opponents and things like that, we get secure phones. How do we ensure people in those countries get secure phones? Uh, because you know those phones will be shipped there, and governments could easily intercept delivery routes and things like that, and and install um, security loopholes after the fact, sort of before between the vendor and the user. I mean, I, I don't think that we need to worry right now about governments doing things to force users to have insecure phones, because I think that Google and Samsung are doing a pretty good job of making that happen as it is. <laughs> um, look, I'm, I'm not going to stand up, up here and try to convince you that extreme privacy is the right choice, or, or that the government should never be able to monitor communications. I personally believe that, and that's why I work for a civil liberties group that sues the government uh, and, and that tries to make surveillance as difficult as possible. Um, it'd be great if you came to my side, but I don't really care. Uh, the purpose of this talk is, is to emphasize that whether or not you think that the state should always be able to listen or never be able to listen, that doesn't matter. But what, it's a problem when the state can only listen to the poor and the rich are off limits. That's a problem. Uh, and <laughs> there, So my, my favorite uh, Fourth Amendment Law Review article, this is like super nerdy, um, is an article by a, a now deceased law professor called Bill Stunts, and it's called The Distribution of Fourth Amendment Privacy. It's behind a paywall. It's, it's criminal that it's behind a paywall. But he talks about the ways in, in the pre-internet era of how the poor get screwed on privacy. So the rich have cars that cannot be easily searched by the police. The poor ride the bus to work, and the police can bring drug dogs on the bus. The rich have air conditioning in their homes, but the poor don't. And so in the summers, the poor are sitting on their stoops drinking a beer, and then they get harassed by the police for drinking in public. He goes through all of these ways that the poor suffer when it comes to uh, privacy and, and law enforcement. Now, the problem with Stunts' argument is his solution is to just take away the privacy rights of the rich. I don't really like that approach. But I do think, as a community, we should be talking about the fact that the most, privileged, the most privileged in our societies are getting the benefits of privacy and digital security, uh, and those who are harassed daily by the police are left completely vulnerable. We need to do a better job of ensuring that these security tools are trickling down and that law enforcement has as difficult a time hacking low-income users and less educated users as they do hacking those of us who are getting updates, who are using end-to-end -end encryption uh, because of our, our, our tech uh, experience and privilege. <laughs> 
that working. Um, so when Jim Comey, the director of the FBI, um, talked about the front door, I, I took that to meant due process. So uh, the social compact that exists between people and governments, that the government will follow certain processes, judicial and otherwise. Do you think there's no place for due process in this world? Is, is, there, is there anything like key escrow that, that will allow due process to happen, or, or do you reject the whole idea? I mean, I, so I, I, I've been working in, in the surveillance space for, for nearly a decade, and it, it, it tends to create some degree of cynicism. Um, and I apologize for bringing my, my cynical baggage to the stage here. Um, you know, I, I think what we've seen time and time again through the Snowden disclosures is that the government asks for a front door, they use the front door, and then they go in the back door as well, right? So every day, uh, tech companies like Google, like Twitter, like Facebook receive law enforcement demands from governments around the world. Uh, there are dedicated teams of employees at these companies who do nothing but turn over user data in response to appropriate legal process. And if that was, if that was it, that might be fine, but what did we learn through the Snowden disclosures? Just, you know, while governments were going through the front door and demanding in, in the, uh, information by individual users, GCHQ was then monitoring the, the private links between Google and Microsoft and Yahoo's data centers and collecting everything they possibly could about those users' communications. Governments are greedy. Uh, and I'm loath to give them more front door access because I know they will continue to go through the back door as well. And so if we give them key escrow, they will still hack our devices. Um, it's not like we're going to trade one for the other. This isn't Indiana Jones where we swap, uh, you know, the bag of sand in. Uh, my, my reluctance is if we give them key escrow, they're going to take that and then they're going to continue to do everything else they're doing behind closed doors. Okay, let's thank Chris. Thank you. Thank you.